I'm very excited to introduce, oh, I need to not stand there. Um, very excited to introduce uh, Alona Sampson from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I actually teach in her class, <laughs> and, uh, and she's here on semi-short notice, and uh, we're really glad she could come. And you can see the topic of her talk. It, it, it isn't going to have anything to do with germ cell uh, mutations no, or, or epigenetic, because there's no data about that. But we decided, given the uh, em uh, emergency, almost, of this issue, uh, that it really needed to be presented. And so she's going to present something on the toxicology, some other issues related to e-cigarettes. Again, nothing on germ cells, but it will at least lay out what we do know, at least at this point, on this very, very important topic. And obviously, this is an issue, perhaps, for future research that we need to start thinking about. So, Great. Right. Th thank you, David. Um, actually, listening to the talks from this morning gave me a couple of ideas, uh, considering the um, sort of transgenerational effects and it's kind of scary thinking about how many kids are doing this right now. So um, uh, there, there's, there's future, there's potential for future studies here. So just a quick outline of what I'm trying to do here today, just give you a little bit of a historical perspective of e-cigarettes. Uh, why, why are we here? How did we get here? How did actually, where did we go wrong to let this all happen? Um, what's this hype about Juul? Um, if you've not heard about this yet, you better familiarize yourself because that's what everyone is doing. Um, a little bit about health effects. We're still sort of trying to figure out what's going on, but you know, there's probably some that we can already determine. There are health effects, I can tell you that. Um, and then also here for this audience, how e-cigarettes violate the principles of toxicology. David is gracious enough to teach in my, in my biochemical and molecular toxicology class, and some of the slides that you're seeing here are actually uh, used in that course as well. Um, and then what's next? Uh, and this is something I literally had to update my slides this morning and I'm already outdated and I'll show you <laughs> some of the numbers that are outdated so it's constantly going on, so what's next? All right, so it's after lunch and I know people are sort of going into a little bit of a lull here, lunch is settling in, so I'm trying to do this a little bit more interactive here. So, to get you engaged in this. Uh, which of these countries ban e-cigarettes? And that's actually a list that's potentially growing. So we have Austria, we have Brunei, Singapore, Belgium, Tajikistan. Which of these countries ban e-cigarettes? All right, all of them. <laughs> and India apparently is now doing the same thing, so they're also going to be banning e-cigarettes. Another one. What do these numbers mean? And the 380 is already incorrect. So we have 2, 7, 36, 380, 8,005 million. The two is the number of states that are now have banned or in the process of banning e-cigarettes. New York is, uh, is the next one. Michigan was the first. Seven, deaths. So we will now have five people that are dead because of vaping-related uh, issues. 36 are the states, uh, 36 plus actually the territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands, states with uh, documented vaping-related illnesses. And this number is incorrect. It is now at 530, not 380 anymore. That's the number of vaping-related injury uh, has, that has been documented by the CDC. 8,000. Warning letters of the FDA that have, have been issued to e-cigarette retailers. 8,000 letters. Nothing has been done and nothing has resulted from that. 8,000 letters. Five million? is now the estimated number of teenagers that are currently vaping. This is the number that was just released by the Youth Tobacco Survey. It was actually backed up by an independent survey from NIDA. Uh, I think that number was earlier mentioned, 25% uh, percent of middle schoolers, 27%. Percent, these are just semantics. It's about 5 million teenagers are currently vaping in the US. So if you're thinking about the sort of germline or heritable effects that we sort of heard about this morning, uh, especially boys, a lot of these are actually boys that are, it's, it's much more prevalent among uh, boys, the, the vaping issue here. So these are potentially health effects for generations to come. So historical perspective, and I think this is really important because people don't understand how we actually got here. And this is really not that long of a history. So it's a little bit more than a decade, probably for the US about, about a decade now. So in 2003, this is really what happened. So the pharmacist of the name of Han Lick, um, whose father died of smoking-related lung cancer, came up with what, with what we now know as the modern e-cigarette. 
and he basically wanted to develop a device that delivers nicotine without the harmful combustion-related um, toxicants that are inhaled and that we now know cause a lot of the cancer or a lot of the um, smoking-related issues. So that was the original intent. In 2006, he actually found, found at the company Ruan, Ruan e-cigarettes, and they were important, imported to the U.S. as a nicotine inhaler. In 2009, Obama signed into law the, smoking, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. E-cigarettes were not part of that because they really hadn't been on the market yet. We didn't know what to do. But in 2009, the FDA actually directs the U.S. Customs and Border Protection to reject the entry of e-cigarettes as drug delivery devices. The FDA actually, e uh, Smoking Everywhere, which was the, actually the company or the e-cigarettes from Ruan, from the original e-cigarette coming from China, uh, basically sued the FDA and said it was not a drug delivery device, it was not a nicotine delivery device, it was a tobacco product. FDA lost that lawsuit and, you know, the rest is history. In 2010, we actually had the first vape fest in <laughs> Richmond, Virginia, home of Philip Morris and Altria, and these vape fests are everywhere now. If you've not seen one, it's quite the sight. Uh, in 2011, it started to become clear that we have potentially an, a public health problem here. Uh, the Obama administration proposes to ban e-cigarettes on airplanes. You may remember there were a lot of issues with exploding e-cigarettes, and that was basically what prompted some of that. Of course, they then sort of, um, the vaping industry starts to form their own association. And in 2012, we have the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association is launched. And with that also comes, obviously, lobbying power. In 2013, people realized, wow, this is actually, this is a potential public health emergency. We need to do something here. And there was a bipartisan petition to the FDA to actually urge and regulate products that they deemed tobacco products. And this is where the deeming rule and the deeming regulations started. In 2014, the FDA releases the proposed regulation exerting authority of over e-cigarettes, and that's the deeming rule, and I'll get to that in a second. In 2014, Oxford termed vaping or vape word of the year. You really know that you've made it into mainstream and Oxford considers you word of the year. So that's how quickly the popularity rose in the U.S. alone. And this was a giant setback. In 2015, Public Health England, which is the equivalent of the FDA in the U.K., declares that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. This was largely based on first-generation e-cigarettes, on the e-liquids, and they looked for cancer-causing chemicals in those e-liquids. So they looked for nitrosamines, they looked for benzoapyrene, they looked for things that we know are present in combustible tobacco that cause cancer. Of course they are not in e-liquids. So of course they came up with the conclusion they're 95% safer. So that was the basis for that statement. In 2015, Juul was actually uh, introduced. Does anybody know where Juul came from? Juul was a master's thesis project by two students from Stanford. Thank you, Stanford. <laughs> um, and they basically designed this engineering product and then they marketed it to Pax Labs. Pax Labs is located in California and their original uh, market or their original market share was actually vaporizing botanicals. So they're really more in the pot market, but they basically uh, used Juul and then basically brought it to market. In 2016, uh, we actually passed the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act, and that was because a lot of these e-liquids looked like candy, smelled like candy, had the labeling of candy, and a lot of kids actually uh, sort of opened it up and drank it. And nicotine, as all of you know, is poisonous. And so the calls to the Poison Control Center skyrocketed, and so since 2016, we have to have child-proof containers. And then, of course, in May 2016, the FDA deeming rule was passed. And the deeming rule basically regulates new and emerging tobacco products, among which e-cigarettes is one of them. Um, and in this particular, even though um, Democrats, the Democratic senators demanded additional ruling on flavoring, it did not have any ruling on flavoring, and it really was on tobacco and nicotine that was the focus of it. A opportunity lost. Um, of course, elections have consequences. 
And there's actually a really cool GIF from uh, Representative Duncan Hunter, where he actually vaped in Congress. Um, and Senator Johnson, Representative Hunter, actually urged, sent a letter to incoming <coughs> Vice President Pence to basically consider repealing the entire demon rule. That obviously did not happen, but a lot of the deadlines were kicked down the road by five years. In 2018, Juul's market share rose to almost, to over 70%. That is ridiculous. <laughs> so if you think about, I think, I'm trying to see now where it is. I think Altria is in that orange slice. So Altria is Philip Morris. Their product only had about a 7% market share. They did not really like that. So if you can't beat them, you buy them. So Altria then, in December of 2018, uh, bought 35% of the market share of Juul. In March, between March and, and May of 2019, uh, FDA Commissioner or Chief Gottlieb threatens to actually pull a lot of these flavors, these pod-based e-cigarettes, in particular Juul. He had his focus on Juul to get Juul off the market. And he really sort of admitted, even though he early on said we need to basically weigh, you know, e-cigarettes as a cessation device and things like that, he really sort of realized in, in March, May of 2019 that we struck the wrong balance on e-cigarettes. Well, he left the administration shortly thereafter. And in May 2019, we started to see things that happened. Uh, you may remember, actually, uh, the FDA started collecting data on seizures. There are a lot of seizure cases that became apparent with a, probably an overdose of nicotine. This was actually uh, the North Carolina Attorney General, Josh Stein. Uh, he sued Juul for targeting youth. That's really big from a tobacco state like North Carolina. That was pretty big. Uh, and the mother of the boy, Kelly Kennard, actually was on stage when he announced that. And she basically said, our son needed treatment that didn't exist. Or basically had a disease that didn't exist a couple years ago. In May 2019 to present, uh, FDA now has a new chief, uh, Dr. Ned Sharpless. I actually know Ned. He was a professor at UNC. He actually had one of my students from the tox program in his lab. Uh, he was the, the, uh, the director, still is the director of the NCI, and he's now the interim FDA um, chief. And he pulled back on curbing Juul. Uh, this, the, the sort of proposition that uh, Scott Gottlieb made and continues to emphasize the potential use of e-cig and smoking cessation. That was in May. You can see I'm, I'm sort of keep trying to add things onto the right. Uh, it's getting tighter and tighter over there. So this is the last thing that I could squeeze in there because it's really current. Since June of 2019, we now until present, we're now collecting data on these vaping-related illnesses. In 2019, Ned Sharpless still said, you know, we, we need to look at both sides. And literally within a month, that's what happened. All right. So what are e-cigarettes? The better the question to ask is really what are they not? So these are what's considered to be pod-based devices or a vape pen. Then you have what's called Juul or a Soren drop. The Soren drop is really popular among high schoolers as well. But then because it is not regulated, it's the Wild West. Anything goes. This is an e-cigarette. We have one in the lab. It is an e-cigarette. Then you have these uh, ultrasonic heaters. They actually don't use heat. They ultrasonicate the e-liquid. You have what's called vapeware that looks like a Fitbit. You have things that are Bluetooth connected to your phone. You can actually receive phone or listen to music, or you can actually incorporate them into your iPhone as an iPhone case. So anything goes. So who's using e-cigarettes and why? And I think this is where the messaging went wrong. This is a clinical trial, a uh, randomized clinical trial that was conducted in the UK, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, by a group from, from the UK. And they basically did a, a randomized current smokers to either a traditional non -re nicotine replacement therapy group or an e-cigarette group. And what they found was that with the one-year abstinence rate was significantly higher in the e-cigarette group, 18% versus 10% in the, con in the conventional non uh, nicotine replacement therapy users. But in the e-cig users, you still had 80% uh, that still used e-cigarettes after one year, whereas the nicotine replacement therapies, they actually kick the nicotine habit. So that's the difference. So you, you basically are replacing one nicotine uh, source with another nicotine source. But what's really more alarming to me, my primary appointment at UNC is in the Department of Pediatrics. So this is really the number that I care about. 
because I also have two kids in that category. So what the, this, these are the new data from the youth tobacco uh, survey that literally came out about a week ago. Um, and this is what I think scared the crap out of the FDA. So when you saw what last year uh, from, 20, from 2017 to 2018, we saw that the jump in e-cig using uh, kids jumped to 20.8%, so about a fifth. In the 2019 data, that's now 27.5%. I don't know whether you sort of, uh, you've listened to some of the, the vaping industry or the director of the vaping um, um, association, and what he highlighted from these data is like, but look, the smoking rate is now 5.8%. So from the 2018 youth tobacco survey data, one thing that we also know is that in the United States, youth are actually much more likely to use e-cigarettes than adults. That's in the US, maybe very different in the UK and in Europe, that's in the US. Um, and also, what's really interesting here, 40% of that, I call them the U25s, the people that are under 25 years old, um, 40% of those that are e-cigarette users have never smoked a cigarette. So these are novel nicotine-dependent e-cigarette users. So we're creating a new generation of nicotine-addicted adults and who knows what you know, uh, generation. What is an e-cigarette? Um, if you don't know, down there on the bottom left, that's a mango-flavored jewel pod. That is one of the hottest things on the market. It's really hard to get. And then you have these sort of e-cig re refill liquids they come in all kinds of different flavors. This particular one called spoiled milk. I have no idea why someone would find that enticing, but it is available online. So what is an e-liquid? So you have the base compounds, uh, which are propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. These are also very abundant in, in other consumer products, like cosmetics, uh, fog machines use this. So this, these are products that have been tested in other, in other products that being other consumer products, but probably not in these devices. Flavorings, and I'll get to that in a second. Nicotine, and in the original um, sort of uh, box mods type devices, you had nicotine as a free base, and I'll get to that in a second, between zero to 36 mg per mil. Juul started actually get, coming around and had 50 mg per mil. The highest that I've seen now is between 70 and 80 mg per mil. All right, to give a comparison, a cigarette has about 1.2 to 1.8 weight by volume nicotine. 70 mix, that's 70, that's seven percent. That's a lot more nicotine weight by volume. And then there's other additives because you know there's really not a lot of con you know control and regulation. So there've been contaminants found, Cialis. <laughs> that's an interesting contaminant in there. Um, you have weight loss drugs, they're actually sort of marketed as, uh, as that, also vitamin B, and then you have, you know, your picker-upper or your calmer-downer e-cigarette, whether, depending on whether you put melatonin or caffeine in there. So again, it's the wild west out there. So nicotine. What is the chemistry behind Juul? And this is again, I mean, these two graduate students from Stanford are genius. They're really, really clever. So what they did is normally nicotine in cigarettes occurs as a free base. The problem with that is it's a basic pH or a pH of 8. If you inhale that, that is really irritating to the back of your throat. So it is user limited as to how much nicotine you can actually inhale. Who here has smoked cigarettes? All right, so you know what I'm talking about. So when you smoke, you get this sort of throat hit, it sort of burns in the back of your throat, and that's because, among other things, it's because of the high pH. What Juul did, it actually sort of used nicotine as a nicotine salt, or as a benzoic acid salt, and we're actually trying to find out now what the chemistry does. There may be other things that this sort of benzoic acid chemistry does. But from a pH perspective, it then dropped the pH down to a more neutral pH. So you have a much smoother sensation in the back of your throat. You don't have that limitation by just because it's so irritating to the back of your throat that you can't take in more. The other thing is benzoic acid is, is used as a food stabilizer. Uh, it's a very known food stabilizer in many, many products. So it actually probably also improved stability of nicotine in this particular electric. And this is, a, this, is a, this is a slide that I modified from Avi Resvani, who is a, a nicotine addiction specialist at Duke. And he sort of gave me um, um, this diagram and I sort of adjusted it to highlight 
how Juul fits this drug addiction paradigm. Many of you know, for in order for a drug to work or have a really good addictive uh, potential, you need to have three factors. The factors are the user, the drug, and the environment. And the user, no matter if you're, if you're younger, you're more likely to actually become addicted just because your brain is not fully developed, there's neurodevelopmental issues here, so age is a big factor here. So the younger you are, the more likely you are becoming addicted to a drug. Psychiatric state as well. So um, a lot of the um, uh, people with uh, uh, mental disability are much more uh, likely to get addicted. The drug itself. So drugs have certainly an addictive potential. And nicotine, as far as I know, is one of the most addictive drugs out there. So it fits perfectly here, and nicotine salt, and at high levels, doubles and triples on that drug uh, potency. And then, of course, your environment. That's one of the reasons why smoking is so low in the United States. My kids wouldn't think you know, at all, ever, about smoking because it's so poo-pooed among their peers. Smoking is gross. Smoking is not cool. But now, Juul became cool, became on Instagram. You basically posted pictures on Snapchat. You exchanged Juul, and so it became, there's accessories for Juul. Good God, I mean, the market is unbelievable. So the peers actually propagated this sort of Juul addiction uh, paradigm. And those are the three things that I think led to where we are today. But one thing that I think is, is really critical is like we need to educate our teens and our teenagers of what actually is going on because a lot of them have no idea what they're actually doing. I give talks to high schoolers, middle schoolers, and I ask them questions, you know, do you have any questions for me? And they often tell me, well, what's the big deal? It's just water vapor. I'm like, no, 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 no. So, so we need to um, tell them that this is not just pure water vapor. When they actually self-identified themselves, and these are studies done by Master Gunovich at, uh, in, in uh, New York, where he actually looked at uh, 40 uh, self-reported e-cig users, and what he found was they basically said, yeah, I don't, I don't vape anything with nicotine, that's not cool, I could become addicted. Well, the urine analysis tells otherwise, so they don't even know that they're vaping nicotine. Um, and the Juul users actually had much higher nicotine levels or markers of nicotine in their serum samples and their urine samples, no surprise there. But the other thing, too, is what they found was that e-cigarette users were also much more likely to have THC in their urine, uh, urinary THC levels, meaning there's a lot of dual use between THC as well as Juul. So that they often go hand in hand. And I'll show you at the last slide one of the reasons why that may be. But how much nicotine are we actually talking about? That's one of the things, too, that I think is, is a problem with messaging here. Um, to the smokers in the audience or former smokers, when you smoke a cigarette, you light the cigarette, you have about 10 to 12 puffs, you are done. That is your smoking session until you light the next cigarette. When you have e-cigarettes, some of these things can have up to three, four, five hundred puffs. So it's never ending. So we know a pack of cigarettes, and this is a problem too, we don't really have a pack year history equivalent for e-cigs now. We know a pack of cigarettes is about 20 cigarettes. A pot of Juul, which is about yay big, 0.7 mils, is about two packs of cigarettes. This knockoff Juul is 75 cigarettes. The Sorin pot is 90 cigarettes. That's four and a half packs of cigarettes in one, basically, one sitting that you could potentially vape. That's the big problem. About a Juul pot, so one of the things that I do too when I give uh, ped pediatric grand rounds or I talk to pediatricians or healthcare providers, would you recognize a Juul pod? And these are physicians, these are healthcare providers that take care of my kids. So I ask them, do you re would you recognize a Juul pod? And how many do you think would recognize a Juul pod? 50%, that's pathetic. So one of the things I do now when I give talks to pediatricians, I actually bring a Juul and I bring Juul pods so they can hold them in their hand. But one thing that was really striking to me when I gave this at UNC Pete's Grand Rounds last time, um, at the end, uh, the chief resident came up to me and she's like, well, okay, so now I have a 14-year-old nicotine-addicted kid in my, ki in my clinic. What do I do now? I was stumped by that question. I'm like, uh, I'm a toxicologist. That's not what I do. But it was a really important question that I did not have the answer for. 
And the reality is we have many different types of nicotine replacement therapies. These are a lot of the ones that are over the counter. The inhalers and the nasal sprays are prescription. You've all probably have seen the commercial about the cold turkey and Chantix, uh, the drug that Pfizer is, um, is, is um, uh, releasing. None of these are actually indicated for people under the age of 18. More importantly, Chantix or Pfizer actually had a clinical trial in uh, kids or teenagers, 12 to 16 year old, there were a couple of 17 and 19 year old kids in that trial as well, and it failed, they actually had to stop it. So, nicotine addiction in a teenager is very different than nicotine addiction in a 40, 50, 60 year old, and that's the problem. We have nothing for these kids right now, pharmacologically. What is the evidence that vaping is actually harmful to your health? And this is the million dollar question, and for many of you here, this is obviously something very near and dear. Um, usually when we do these studies as toxicologists, you have to do a two-year rodent studies in two different rodent species to basically characterize it as a carcinogen. Well, think about it. Juul really hasn't become popular until 2016. Even if we had started these studies right in 2016, we would just about now kill all these animals and wouldn't have the studies. So um, we don't know yet. That's the problem. But the other problem here is why are we even comparing it? Why are we looking at cancer as the ultimate endpoint? We know cigarette smoking causes cancer. There's no question about that. But why do we use what we know is caused by cigarette smoking? Why do we use this as the gold standard to see whether e-cigarettes also achieve that? That's the wrong basis. So this is a slide, as, as you can imagine. I have updated this talk many, many times. None of the slides that I've given four years ago are still in my slide deck except for this one. This, I said this from the beginning, these are very different chemicals that we're inhaling. We are comparing apples and oranges and we're doing the wrong thing. So what are the known health effects in addition to the 530 vaping related lung, lung injury cases that people are trying to identify what's going on here? There's actually been evidence out there for a while before all of this happened starting in June that there's something wrong here. So there are a lot of uh, sort of individual case reports. So there are lipid pneumonia case reports that we now see as well. Um, there was one from Allison Larkin about hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which also had eosinophilic pneumonia as well as lipid pneumonia, really well characterized patient. Um, there's also tranquil, there was also um, other lung injury related cases. We published this one. Uh, these were two cases that came to UNC in November of 2018. These were uh, 16 and 17 year old teenagers, underlying asthma, um, and they basically had a recent history of vaping and they ended up on ECMO. They both lived. One of them decided to quit vaping, the other one did not. The other one had already some severe exacerbations. So, there may be exacerbations of pre-existing diseases as well. So of course, this is now what's really all in the news, the vaping-related lung injury. Um, they're characterizing it. It definitely has, um, the radiology seems to be very common, uh, or the same kind of phenotype. It basically has like a pneumonia-type phenotype on radiology, under the CT scans. Uh, but that's where a lot of the sort of uh, similarities stop. So p some people have lipoid pneumonia, some people have eosinophilic pneumonia. Some re uh, respond to steroids, actually a lot of them respond to steroids, some, some do not. Um, so there's a lot of um, trying to understand now what this actually is and what's of course causing it. Um, and I'll get to that in the end as well. But one question, I think where we went wrong from the beginning and the, the issue of not um, regulating the flavors is I think what got us into this mess to some extent from the get-go. Um, and one thing that probably um, uh, uh, policymakers shied away from is these flavors were regarded, generally regarded as safe, grass. But they were generally regarded as safe from an ingestion route. So when we have flavoring agents, they are safe. We all use them all the time. We had them for lunch right now. We all use them, we're exposed to them. They're safe, so why are we worried? This is a slide from my introductory uh, toxicology lecture. Kezia remembers this because she took my course. 
Um, and this is the basic principle of toxicology. Uh, Paracels is basically the dose makes the poison. We all know this in this room. But I want to amend this because for flavoring agents, does the route of exposure make the poison? I think you guys understand uh, that is the case. So when you have three major routes of exposure, you have ingestion, inhalation, and dermal exposure. That's the, in the environmental field. In the, in the drug delivery field, you also have IV uh, exposure, but this, for, for this audience, these are the three major routes of exposure. So when you change the route of exposure to something that is, we know is safe for, let's say, skin application, but now all of a sudden you ingest it, do you change the toxicity? Does anybody know an example for that? The Tide Pod Challenge, which is a really bad idea, but it's, that's basically what happened. Tide Pods are perfectly safe when they explode on your skin. You can rub them on your skin, two, three, go for it. It will never, ever have a toxicity. But when you ingest them, they do. The same thing is true when you change it from ingestion to inhalation. And the most documented case that we already know about is popcorn lung. This is what happened in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Workers uh, that worked in a popcorn factory were exposed to occupational levels of the buttery flavor diacetyl. And they came down with a disease that you normally only see in rejected lung transplant patients, bronchiolitis obliterans. And it was later diagnosed that basically came from inhaling too much of this buttery flavor. Buttery flavor diacetyl isn't butter. It actually is added to butter to make butter taste more like butter. I love butter. I'm not going to stop eating butter, but inhaling it is probably not a good idea. So there's also other e -fl e, uh, flavorings and e-liquids that anybody who's a chemist in the audience would sort of suspect, huh, those structures look they could be very reactive chemicals. These are all aromatic aldehydes, cinnamaldehyde, benzaldehyde, vanillin, and ethyl vanillin. These are very popular flavoring chemicals in e-cigarettes. Vanillin and benzaldehyde are very popular. Cinnamaldehyde, because we actually published a bunch of articles on them, and so they actually, when you read the e-liquid or the e-cigarettes or vaping blogs, they refer to our studies and they're self-regulating. So they're actually not vaping cinnamaldehyde anymore because they're scared by our article, which is kind of fun. Um, so you have these sort of three different flavors. You sort of see that there are sort of structurally similar and functionally, they're actually similar as well, and we've published a few articles on that. But one thing that I want to show you is uh, some of the studies that a former graduate student of my lab, Phil Clapp, has done on looking at innate respiratory immune defense mechanisms and the role and the effect of cinnamaldehyde on that. And he looked at both mucosillar clearance as well as innate immune function. Um, and he basically looked at the flavored e-liquids or flavored e-liquid aerosols and whether it actually changed the function. And when we looked at macrophages, neutrophils, and natural killer cells, if you can imagine those as your first guard, your first line of defense in the respiratory tract, all of them are basically completely shut down. Their function, they're not dead. They're not dead, but their function is shut down. This is a picture from a human alveolar macrophage that we got from a human volunteer. In ex vivo, we actually stimulated it with cinicide, which is a uh, cinnamaldehyde-flavored um, e-liquid. And on the left is PGVG, and we feed it these sort of fluorescently tagged bacteria that are red, so the macrophage loves gobbling these up. They're little pac mans they love gobbling it up. So you see a lot of these sort of bacteria inside the macrophage, and we give it cinicide. It can't do that anymore. It's sort of a really frustrated and angry-looking macrophage. Um, it's not dead, but it just can't do its job anymore. And one of the things that we published basically all of the basic um, energy bioenergetics is shut down. So they can no longer produce ATP and energy to do a lot of sort of biological function. So how toxic are e-cig e flavors? And when I started doing um, this sort of e-cigarette research, I talked to my, my kids are sort of my small little focus groups. And their kids, when they come over, they're now afraid to bring their friends over because they know I'm going to ask them. Um, so they're my little <laughs> ongoing focus group at the kitchen table. And so I asked them in the beginning, I said, what, do I, what can I do to make you guys understand this is a bad idea? And I said, why don't you smoke? And they're like, mom, we all saw the picture of the black lung. And so that is a picture that they sort of, it's like, oh my gosh, that's a bad, that's a bad idea. Smoking is a bad idea because I'm going to have this black lung. 
She, and my mom, my, my, my daughter told me, she says, Mom, you need to show scary pictures. So this is the scariest thing I can come up with. But I think, <laughs> I think it actually brings home the point because um, a lot of people have now borrowed this slide from me. So what we did, like we call this our Friday afternoon unauthorized experiments that basically never get published, but we have a lot of fun with them. So this is a regular tissue culture plate. We take our PGVG, which is our uh, just a control. Uh, we four, took four different cinnamaldehyde containing e-liquids, our cinnocyte, hot cinnamon candy, napalm. Why would anybody keep napalm? Um, atomic cinnocyte, and then the pure cinnamaldehyde compound. So hot cinnamon candy we knew from mass spec analysis had actually very little cinnamaldehyde in there. So this was a little bit of like a dose response here. So uh, we walked away for two and a half hours, had an extended lunch on a Friday afternoon, and came back to the lab and saw this. What do you think that is? The plastic corroded. So I still have the, the plate in my lap. I actually bring this to talks as well. I want people to understand this is what happened. It basically feels like somebody took a knife and scraped the bottom of the plastic. Cinnamel, I did even more. It actually, we were like, what is this? What's floating on top? It was actually, it melted the plastic. There was a sheet of plastic that came off. So if cinnamaldehyde does this to plastic, <laughs> what do you think it does to your lungs? And that's something that resonates with kids. That's something that they get. So I show this slide all the time and let them touch the, the, the plate. I'm actually thinking about making an, an Instagram video with kids actually redoing this experiment and filming it themselves. Plants, you know, stay tuned for that. So what is next? It's, this is a slide that probably I, I needed to update like five minutes before I came up here. So um, health 202, not 101, 202, it's now vaping related illnesses sparked by e cig crackdown, but it may actually be a different culprit. Is it maybe THC, is it marijuana, is it something combined, what is it? And again, I'm going back to this. And you've probably heard in the news um, potentially some of the culprits that are linked to these vaping-related injuries. So here we have now something that is safe for ingestion and safe for dermal application. But obviously, when you change it to inhalation, you change the toxicity. And what I mean by that is vitamin E and coconut oil. Why are vitamin E and coconut oil used? Coconut oil because it's, it's one, um, it's a medium chain triglyceride or medium chain fatty acid and it's, it's, it's used very often in that capacity. Vitamin E, so THC is actually, THC oil is quite expensive. So in these black market or basement manufactured THC oils, they actually take THC oil and basically dilute it with vitamin E acetate or these medium chain triglycerides to make more of it because it's, you know, it's very expensive. So there are, um, there are two major companies that are selling these sort of THC cartridges. It's uh, Chronic and Dank. So you may have heard in the, in the news Dank Vapes. If not, familiarize yourself with the, with the term. So a lot of knockoffs now are being made. Um, so these Dank Vapes are now being counterfeited in basements where you basically take old Dank Vape um, cartridges and refill them with stuff that you make in your basement terrifying. Um, on the right hand side is actually um, a product from Dank Vape and this goes back to the original problem. Not, it's not just e-cigarettes and nicotine containing products anymore that are available in Blueberry Crush or Fruity Pebbles. These are THC products now that are following the same marketing strategy with the same kind of cutesy little figurines here, with the same kind of flavorings added. So the flavorings have not gone away, the marketing has not gone away, and that's where we are now. We don't know yet what the outcome is. So, with that, I need to obviously thank a bunch of people that have helped me along the way. Uh, all the great, great students, postdocs from the curriculum of toxicology at UNC, fantastic uh, students, I work a lot with UNC's um, Institute for the Environment, Community Engagement and Outreach Corps. They are fabulous. They help me um, basically bring these talks to lay people. Uh, my funding, some of the chemistry uh, people that help, help me along the way. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
So, so we had uh, Ilona to EPA earlier this year, and she simply blew the auditorium away. And that's why we wanted to bring her here with you today. And I noticed, Sorry, I, I sensed, I know, it's okay. I sensed not a single one of you was sleeping after lunch. <laughs> so uh, another reason why we booked her in for when we did. So any questions? Yeah, I'll come right back there, David. So I'm unfortunately quite familiar with the cognitive effects of a packet cigarette today. What are the cognitive effects of these low, low uh, levels? So um, that's an excellent point. So one of the things that occurred early on is the seizures. You know, the seizure effects, and so I think it's just a nicotine overdosing. Um, the, anecdotally, I can tell you from my little focus group of my kids around the kitchen table. Um, these kids are now addicted to nicotine, and Chapel Hill is obviously a little bit of a pressure cooker with parents both coming from Duke and UNC, so it's an academic pressure cooker. So these kids want to perform very, very highly. So a lot of these kids are now addicted to nicotine, and apparently this New Year's Eve, one of the biggest things was to quit Juul. That was the biggest New Year's resolution. The kids quickly realized it really impaired their academic performance in high school, and they continued, they basically went back to Jeweling. So that's one of the cognitive effects that's anecdotally reported. I'm not sure there's actually been, a, you know, really good um, comprehensive epidemiological studies. But yes, so kids on nicotine, obviously they get the same rush, probably even more than an adult, and they're much more difficult to kick the habit. Scary. Larry. What's known about mutations or other early indications of cancer? So I don't know. I, I, I know, and I can't say anything more than that, but I know there is a paper coming out soon uh, providing some initial data on e-cigarette and cancers. And that's all I can tell you. <laughs> is that fair enough? <laughs> Sorry about that. So we don't, so, so one of the things that's really, I'm, I'm not a cancer biologist, I'm not a mutation specialist. I, I try to stay away from DNA. Um, but if you, if you recognize, if you, look at the, um, if you look at the chemicals again, those flavoring reagents, those are aliphatic, um, ar aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, ar aromatic, yeah, uh, aldehydes. They're gonna probably be adducting to DNA um, they're going to form DNA adducts, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know whether it's ever been done. Um, but I would think they, they I mean, they're highly reactive with a lot of different things. So um, I would think they cause DNA adducts and potentially mutations. Right, as someone not coming from the US, what's the regulation on sale of these products? I mean, is there an age restriction? Are they allowed on display? No, oh, you really are not from around here, are you? <laughs> um, so there is a bill in the Senate on Mitch McConnell's desk called Tobacco 21, which is supposed to regulate all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, uh, to the age of 21. However, if you've ever gone to one of those internet sales sites, they basically ask you, are you over the age of 21, or they have you put in your birth date. I always make myself younger when I do that. Um, I'm always 39 when I do that. Um, so they basically have not really strict age regulations. They're just, it's a yes, no, or you put in a fake birth date, and then you're on the website. And if you've gotten a Visa gift card, you know, for Christmas or for your birthday, there's really no reason why you couldn't purchase this. So it's a big problem. They can get it. My kids can get it. They say, oh, yeah, we can get it. I hope they did not. 